Thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit about my work and to be part of such a distinguished panel. I want to share with you, my name is Safia Noble. I'm a professor at UCLA. I wrote a book called Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism, which when I started about 10 years ago on that book, which was a dissertation that became a book, uh, it was very, very difficult to get even four people to sit on a dissertation committee and acknowledge openly that algorithms and technology could in fact inherently discriminate. In fact, the ideas that we're talking about today have become mainstream over the last decade. Now we hear lots of conversations about the biased algorithms and how AI and algorithms can discriminate, but I promise you that just 10 years ago, when we talked about computer code and computer programming and its incredible importance in fomenting uh, social inequality and discrimination, people would say to me, Safia, that's impossible because computer code is just math. I would argue that that's a, a bit like saying human beings are just cells. We're just mitochondria. It's really insufficient to talk about programming and code and platforms uh, at the level of thinking of them as simply uh, mathematical formulations. They're in fact, of course, hell, uh, inherently programmed with all kinds of bias, but they're also deployed and weaponized in a variety of different ways, which of course Joan and uh, others on the panel will talk about today. So I wanna share with you some of the findings that informed that book, Algorithms of Oppression, which really started quite simply by doing keyword searches on a variety of racialized and gendered identities. I'm a black woman. At one point in my life, I was a black girl. I have a daughter. I have a host of nieces. I was curious about the way in which people were relating to platforms like search engines as kind of the new public library. This is, of course, what was happening when I was going back to graduate school. Uh, around 2009. Everyone was enamored with, of course, many of us were on the old internet, let's say the, the, the web 1.0, which was, um, I'm not gonna, Ethan, talk about full of, being full of pop-up ads. Instead, I'm gonna <laughs> say that it was, um, you know, a very disorganized kind of experience. And so many people were thrilled to see things like search engines come along. And I was curious about this because at the time that I was entering graduate school, I was just leaving a 15-year career in advertising and marketing where we were deeply invested in ad agencies in trying to manipulate the kinds of results that showed up on the first page of search. We, this was before we started calling, um, calling that phenomena SEO or search engine optimization. It was just how do we make sure that content shows up uh, about our clients to the first page because most people, if you look at the information retrieval research, do not go past the first page of results, both in a search engine or in a library database search. So what happens on the first page of search is incredibly important, just like what happens, let's say, in the first couple of minutes of your news feed in a social media platform. It's very important. And the types of content that I found as I was doing these keyword searches on terms like black girls, Latina girls, Asian girls, was represented almost exclusively with pornography. And the question is how can that be that black girls and Latina girls and Asian girls are synonymous with pornography? You don't have to add the words porn or sex. That's just how we were encoded into the platforms. And of course, part of that is because the commodification of women, and particularly of women and girls of color, is incredibly big business in the United States. And so these are the kinds of things that uh, really gave life to the book. And ultimately, as I was writing the book and collecting a lot of data about all of the kind of different ways in which people of color and vulnerable people are misrepresented in platforms, it became apparent that we are uh, in a crisis in the sense that we cannot control the ways in which we're represented or misrepresented in these platforms. In fact, those who have the most money are the winners in these platforms because these are advertising platforms and they're organized to return profit and to circulate what is often the most titillating, 
egregious kinds of content because that, in fact, is the content that goes viral. It's the kind of content that gets clicks. It's the kind of content that um, puts us at peril. The other thing that I talk about in this book is, of course, the case of Dylan Roof and the fact that you know Dylan Roof, who, if you don't know, um, was a, a, a open fire on um, unsuspecting African-American worshipers in Charleston, South Carolina in the summer of 2015 and killed nine African-Americans in Emanuel AME Church. And at the time, of course, we've had many more um, violent mass murders um, motivated by race and religion. But at the time, it was one of the worst uh, mass murders we'd seen in the United States. And Dylan Roof, in his own words, articulated that um, he was, in fact, searching for information about um, Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman and was trying to make sense of the news reporting that was happening and why, who was this Trayvon Martin? And so you think about the role that, um, uh, we, that, that we ascribe to search engines in particular, but other kinds of um, platforms, certainly, that are uh, increasingly responsible for uh, sharing out information or fact-checking or providing credible resources. I think that we've given over an incredible amount of power to these platforms, and of course, this is what we're here to talk about today. But one of the things I want to underscore is that it's really been um, women, women of color, LGBTQI, feminists, um, scholars and journalists who really, we have also put ourselves on the line, taken an incredible number of body blows just to normalize this conversation and bring it into the mainstream. And most of us have done this with very, very little kind of financial support or resource or investment in our work. And so if there were a, a, another plea that I might make about not just becoming educated, it's to think about what does it cost us when we um, keep investing in the same kind of techno-utopian dreams that come out of major silicon corridors around the United States not just Silicon Valley, but a number of you know, private universities and other kinds of institutions and think tanks uh, that, that are able to amass incredible resources. And after uh, 30 years of selling us this kind of um, celebratory, uh, emancipatory rhetoric about the possibilities of digital technologies and platforms and the internet, um, while the rest of us have been in harm's way and quite frankly paid the price for these kind of alleged um, uh, liberat liberatory possibilities of the internet. And so I would say um, it's important for, you know, I think about the work that Joan is doing, um, despite the fact that it's at Harvard, um, and, and the work that we're doing at UCLA. And, and what does it mean at this particular moment as we're grappling with all of these kinds of issues that we are seeing a massive divestment from public institutions that could serve as the counterweight? You know, I often talk to policymakers and regulators and I say it's insufficient to just think about regulating the big tech sector and not um, also contend with the fact that we are divesting from pub public education, divesting from public universities, divesting from public media. We cannot create successful, powerful, democratic counterweights at the, at, 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 you know, as the, this sector grows at our expense. And of course, being in the University of California system where we should be flush with resources um, and yet our, our system is literally dying on the vine um, relative to other kinds of private universities. And we have Silicon Valley and Silicon Beach in California. But when those companies don't pay taxes, they actually bankrupt our public institutions. And I think this is something we want to contend with today. The last thing I'll say, because I'm out of time, is that we need massive paradigm shifting. We can't just keep investing in the same old um, rhetorics and um, tool making and um, techno deterministic uh, ideas where we're going to somehow perfect the algorithms or perfect the bias out of AI. There was a time in this country when we thought our whole economy was dependent upon things like, oh, big tobacco or big cotton. And we couldn't imagine reorganizing our economy, even those, those <coughs> economies were predicated upon the enslavement and human trafficking of African bodies and the occupation of indigenous lands. I think it's important right now for us to think about how could we have a paradigm shift with respect to big tech, like we've had with respect to big tobacco, and think about all of the ways in which um, communities 
communities are facing incredible harm through the rise of these new predictive technologies. And I think we have a, a great opportunity before us in the next decade. Thank you.